Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session in the Certificate Programs in Python for Algorithmic Trading and Computational Finance. Um, this is the introduction and overview session. My name is Eve. I'm founder and CEO of both Python Quanta, the AI machine, and also the program director of the two certificate programs. Many of you I know are doing the two of them together, which we then call the Platinum Package. That's quite a bit. And today's session is intended to give an introduction to the topics and overview of all the topics, which means classes, courses, recordings, code, uh, other resources um, that accompany this program. That's indeed quite a bit. So uh, I don't want to um, yeah, wait any longer and I want to dive into the agenda that I've planned for today. You see here we have 18 points. Some of them are a little bit longer, some of them are a bit shorter. What is at the core is point number 14, where we are going through a couple of case studies and demos to whet your appetite. Uh, and I must say in this context that this is not meant to be any kind of training session. So this is more for you to get a first introduction and overview as pointed out before. And don't worry if you see anything um, which might not be clear from the outset. Um, that's uh, not surprising probably because uh, we are going to cover all the topics that I'm going to demo later on and that we're going to discuss uh, during this session uh, in detail during the classes and during the formal 12 weeks um, of the program, uh, which precede the practical phase as well as the uh, final project. So we will have a quick introduction there. We Discuss briefly the program. I then show briefly the Quant platform. We discuss finance with Python. There you can expect uh, quite some new stuff in this context. Tools and skills so important in this context. Python for financial data science, Excel databases, NLP, AI and reinforcement learning. Uh, these days absolutely at the core of the programs. And then we have the core classes them themselves. So Python for algo trading as well as Python for computational finance and after we have then gone through the case studies and demos i will also discuss uh, more uh, yeah, administrative and, and organizational topics before we then uh, finish today's session with a brief discussion of the importance of practice so for me it's always very exciting to get started with a new cohort because uh, so far uh, we have added uh, always new stuff have improved things that we have come up uh, earlier and this holds true here for this cohort as well so i'm pretty excited to go with you uh, through the next 12 weeks uh, plus the four weeks of practice and final project so a quick introduction uh, just for those of you um, who want to review what we are all about, where we are coming from. So tpq.io, um, we have uh, well more than 10 years of experience. Everybody working at the company as well, more than uh, 10 years of experience in the field. Python for finance is a general topic, but around this general topic, we provide platform, open source libraries. I've written a couple of books. We provide the certification. Obviously, we run events, uh, digital these days, but also live events, uh, for example, in London, as well as in, in New York, for example. We provide services also to financial institutions and training has become a core pillar of what we stand for. We've also developed a algorithmic trading platform, which allows you to easily deploy AI powered uh, Python formulated, Python coded uh, strategies. Uh, what I always wanted to have is a one click deployment. And this is what we have indeed achieved with the AI machine. So that's uh, also uh, yeah, driven by a um, dedicated team out of India. So for those who want to get a little bit more background, here are links. So this is not meant for us to go through in detail, but you have access to the slides. And with the slides, you have uh, then all the links to further resources if you want to follow along. Uh, too long to be read here, but uh, for those of you who haven't um, yeah, seen, read about what I've been doing or haven't read yet my books here the long version of my bio 
Um, again, feel free to visit my personal page. So I've written a bunch of books. So my background is in quantitative finance, mathematical finance, a PhD in the field. And uh, a couple of years ago, I started combining math finance with Python. And here are two books as an outgrowth of this endeavor. So derivatives, analytics with Python and list of volatility and variance derivatives. These are more or less quant finance books that use Python, uh, but um, the best-selling book out of the, the uh, kind of lengthy list these days of my books is Python for Finance, which has become kind of a standard uh, reference book around the world. And what makes me happy in particular is that it's also used uh, around the world in many, many uh, university courses, master's programs, PhDs use it, but also of course uh, it is used by practitioners. It has been trans translated uh, in Chinese um, into Japanese, what you see here. So also happy of course about that one. These are my two books from 2020. I will say more about them later on uh, because they are in part at least the basis for uh, the core classes um, um, that we are going to discuss later. So the program itself, um, this is just to, yeah, to give you a broad overview what to expect in terms of numbers, not that much in terms of the details, this follows afterwards. So 16 weeks, thousands of lines of code, hundreds of pages as uh, PDF and HTML documentation, uh, hundreds of hours of instruction. So I'm not saying that in order to be successful with the program, everybody must go through every single piece of um, information that we provide, but at least you have the selection, right? For example, let's say um, we have a class about Python for Excel. For some people, this might be really exciting. For others, they might say, well, uh, I'm not in Excel, uh, maybe later on, but uh, when I get started, this is not probably the most important topic for me. So we have the freedom, we have many optional resources as well, but uh, for the core classes, you should really stick to the program. And this again means quite a bit of reading, quite a bit of coding, many, many practical uh, things that you can do where you replicate things, where you have uh, exercises and test projects to uh, refine uh, your skills and to gain mastery maybe from orange belt to some brown belt level and later on with the project in a certain field, even black belt level. So that's the basic idea there. And why is it so important? Yeah, <laughs> because the financial industry today is at least as driven by coding than it is by financial theory. So there's, I don't think there's not a single uh, credit in financial engineer, finance, corporate finance, or whatever uh, the specific master's program is titled that uh, has earned the degree without doing proper programming. So we have come a long way in the finance industry and finance, which started out as a yeah, applied mathematical discipline in the 50s, we can say, is these days uh, a computational finance discipline. And looking forward, it will be more and more so a data-driven, AI-driven, uh, so machine learning, deep learning, reinforcement learning discipline, right? So, and therefore, the big companies, they are looking for uh, people uh, who know about finance, for sure, but uh, who also know how to, for example, obviously here, that's the quote about, uh, know about Python programming. Python has become a standard uh, skill, a key skill in the industry. Therefore, I think you are here with us in the right program. So graduates with tech and finance skills in high demand. Yeah. So it's computer programming these days. So a while back, it was maybe enough to say, well, I have uh, gained mastery with Excel and PowerPoint and Word, so the office uh, suite. Uh, but these days, you need to be able to program and you need to be able to use something else than maybe VBA, uh, smaller VBA snippets within an Excel program. Not to say that um, Excel is not on work anymore, uh, but the demands on the data uh, processing and, and the analytical requirements have risen beyond what you can typically do with uh, standard approaches and um, yeah, traditional um, solutions uh, in the field, right? So finance uh, will also need people who can work with robots, whatever robots means, this can be pretty abstract, right? Just like an AI agent, but it can be pretty concrete as well in the form of an embodied robot um, as AI takes a third of jobs here, right? So job seekers with uh, expertise in artificial intelligence, machine learning data sites are among the most in demand candidates in finance. So we have over the years built a, a strong foothold in this area uh, also 
one of the outgrowths you have seen at uh, my book, Artificial Intelligence and Finance, and you will gain exposure to many, many more um, uh, content than what is in the book itself. For example, in the form of additional reinforcement learning uh, resources, to name just one uh, popular topic these days. So uh, all what we provide you with, you have just seen the numbers, like uh, thousands of lines of code, uh, hundreds of Jupyter notebooks, uh, hundreds of pages of documentation is all delivered in a uni uh, yeah, unique, consistent way. Uh, unique on the one hand, but unified. I think this is the more important uh, adjective here in this context by our Quant platform. So we have built the first platform a couple of years back and the new Quant platform was kind of uh, finished, quote unquote, such a project is never finished, but uh, it has now the major features that we always envisioned uh, towards the end of last year. So I think it's now working well. It's, it's running uh, robustly, which I'm pretty happy about. Maybe it's not perfect, but I think it's the right way to deliver all the content that we uh, are providing you with, uh, which is quite a bit. So everybody of you should have received uh, login credentials. You will find there um, the latest uh, videos, uh, also all the recordings that are available. Uh, depending on your program, this might vary a bit compared maybe to other uh, delegates. And uh, you also find the user forum, which should be your go-to uh, a resource when you have questions or maybe you want to discuss with others um, yeah, about topics that are of interest to you. And uh, again, you find all the resources. And when I get into the first training class, Finance with Python, I will show you uh, how the Quant platform looks like. But again, there are other resources like a brief introduction and overview video are uh, available in this context. And we have shared this with you all already. Yeah. Here it is, the link um, to the Quant platform. You see some yeah, 12 minutes roughly, and it e explains um, how you work with it, how to log in, where you find the resource. But I will do um, maybe even a quicker review of how you can utilize all the resources to your best benefit in this uh, context. Yeah, Finance with Python, that's already the first class, and this is a class that um, we have introduced uh, quite a while back. Uh, the idea was to have a starting point for those who have maybe a strong finance background, but little or no experience in programming, or the other way around uh, for people who have a, a stronger programming background, uh, but little finance experience. So we have many delegates um, which fit these uh, two profiles. Of course, we have uh, some as well, uh, that's for sure, who have both finance and Python or programming experience, but this was uh, yeah, driven by so many inquiries that we received who said, well, I know about finance, I'm a professional, but I just want to get started with programming. Or the other way around, I'm a professional data scientist, I want to enter the financial field. So that's the background of finance with Python, and it is what I call the gentle introduction to the field, where we cover fundamental financial notions and also the fundamentals of financial modeling um, where we get started with the uh, yeah, most simple setup you can imagine uh, two period uh, yeah, two points in time so one period you can say and two states uncertain states in the future that uh, can materialize and then we um, yeah move on but just a tiny bit to a three-state economy in the future, and then a static multi-state economy where we generalize the state space and we add the idea of dynamic economies, which is then more or less the standard, for example, in the context of option pricing. So although this might look a little bit more related to computational finance and the topics covered there, it's also pretty, pretty helpful and also very important, I would say, for what we do in Python for algorithmic trading. So basically for every corner of the rest of the program, um, this will help you uh, uh, yeah, pretty well, I would say. So you have then for the resources, um, as a general rule or guideline, typically um, yeah, three different area sections or types of resources, we can say. So we have first uh, in general a text, not for every class, that's true, but for the main ones. Then we have uh, recordings uh, plus additional resources. We will have live sessions, for example, for Finance with Python, which will replace these recordings um, because there will be yeah, some major updates in this context. And you have all the codes that come with such a class um, 
um, also on Jupyter Lab. So Jupyter Lab as an execution environment now has become standard. So the second generation, if you like, from the um, browser-based um, interactive development environment. So it started uh, basically with IPython notebooks. So I should rather say the third iteration, then moved on towards Jupyter Notebook. And now we have arrived at the fantastic solution, Jupyter Lab, uh, which uh, I think everybody in our field is pre pretty happy with, and uh, which allows you, even without any installation of um, Python on your local machine to just use the browser to access uh, the reading materials, to watch the videos, and to execute the codes, to work with the codes, and to do your own coding, for example, in the context of the exercise. So all against the background of providing a gentle introduction to finance Python and the combination of both. So before I get to the tools and skills, I promise to show you briefly how to work with the platform and how to access uh, the resources. So I'm already uh, locked in here. So when you log in with your credentials, um, you see the latest video. So we just reorganized the platform and we have put in here the, the latest, uh, the, the most recent introduction and overview from the previous cohort. There's not the latest video from the last round, but when you will lock in, you will see first um, the last um, uh, the last session that has been recorded and has been put on the platform. Also on the dashboard, you see latest uh, forum posts. So here's something about the live data API, different results here where somebody's asking why, uh, for example, uh, code executed gives a different output than um, the one presented in the book, uh, back propagation neural nets, running the example. So you see here four posts, which are the latest ones. This is not um, uh, sorted um, uh, chronologically with regard to the first post, but uh, with regard to the replies as well. So whenever we reply now, let's say to the fourth one, it would jump automatically to the first spot here. So that's the dashboard. You see all pretty simple, not that much to navigate. It should just give you an overview of what has been posted and then put on the platform latest. So on the upper left hand side, this is where you find the main navigation. So it's usually uh, not visible, just to provide you with as much real estate on the screen as possible. The first um, point here is the user forum. Then you find courses, trainings, and Jupyter Lab. So with regard to the user forum, um, when you go there, you will see that um, the, the whole setup changes. Again, you see the latest forum posts as before. And then you also see the topics, user forum here. We have Quant Platform Board, Certificate Program itself, Finance with Python, Python for Financial Data Science, Python for Library Trading, et cetera. I think this should be self-explanatory. Uh, when I go, for example, to Python uh, for algorithmic trading, you see here kind of a bunch of posts. And uh, when here you see a, a, a red new, it means that I personally haven't seen uh, the latest posts. So sometimes there are many of these news because I read uh, primarily uh, all the posts by email. So every time you post something or you answer something in the um, in the user forum, we get notified automatically by email. If you have posted something, you are also in uh, the email loop, but not for everything uh, in this context. So for example, here, uh, when I go to the first one, I could scroll down and recently I've answered here a couple of things. There has been a follow up. So you see um, how this basically works. If you want to reply to a certain uh, post, just click uh, reply and then you are in the game. Or go to board and say just a new post. If you have a topic uh, where you face some issue or you want to discuss something in this context, feel free to simply post. So here, uh, boards getting back to the overview, right? And then you can get started again and say, well, I have issues with the Quant platform. Then the first uh, big one here is um, is the area where you should uh, post your question. If it is related to finance with Python, what I want to focus on, then you would go here to finance with Python, create a new topic, and then you would be in the game. And Recall, every time um, you post something, we get notified by email. So no 
need uh, no necessity to write us an additional email saying, I've just posted, uh, posted something on the user forum, please have a look. Uh, this is done automatically, right? Um, so then we have the courses part, which provides you with the reading material. So AI and finance, finance with Python, Python for finance, as well as Python for trading. And I go now to finance with Python. This is what I want to focus on because this is um, A, the starting point, B, uh, something for this week. And you see finance with Python. And I said, there is uh, quite something new. Uh, to be expected here, it just completely reworked, updated, corrected the whole manuscript. So January 2021, I did it over uh, change of the year, actually. And uh, you see here a standard structure, right? It's a, a relatively long document. It's an interactive document. When you say, oh, I want to jump, for example, to static economy. This, of course, is easily done simply by navigating the document. On the left-hand side, you see the table of contents, which is also interactive. And say three-state economy is now the topic of the week, for example. Then you can jump in here and uh, get started reading with chapter three if you have read already chapter one and two. So in between, of course, you can also jump to the different uh, spots, whatever is of interest to you. You can also search um, this document via typical browser search um, and uh, find information, I think, rather quickly. So that's the first thing. And when you read something in the study plan, read chapter one, read chapter three, uh, whatever. So chapter one, you would go to finance with Python, chapter one. And this, uh, when it says read finance with Python, chapter one, this would be the reading assignment here, which you can access on the platform. So here, there's not that much code in the first chapter, but maybe when I jump down to four, let's say, um, after the introduction and a little bit of math, you see that it starts with the code here, right? And there's no need to copy the code here or uh, whatever, yeah, I don't know, uh, copy paste or retype it or whatever. So you have access to all the codes that you see here. So when you recall my, my three different um, uh, types of resources, this is the reading resource and this is how you should consider this. Not to have it as a resource for code, this is a resource for reading, right? So I leave it for a second open here and later uh, close it. The second resource um, we have are the videos plus additional code. And here you have finance with Python, right? There are quite a bunch of classes, obviously. And finance with Python brings me here to the class with the single recordings. At this stage, you have access to the original materials uh, that are there already. So finance with Python 1, 2, 3, 4. But as you know, we also will have live sessions over the course of this and next week, which will replace um, these recordings with new uh, versions. This doesn't hold true for every class that we will do. So this is just now one in this cohort where we do uh, major updates and um, and uh, yeah have the live the live sessions in this context. So when you click, for example, on this video, it should start immediately within the platform. And of course, you can have uh, if you're like me and you have multiple screens. So I'm sitting here in front of three screens. So I could run, for example, um, on one screen. I could run a video, this video here, so and maybe jump back and forth if I fancy. And in another, um, in another, on another screen, in another window, in another tab of a browser, I can have open, for example, here the Jupyter notebook that um, is shown or that is live coded in this class. So that's the basic idea. Um, you have the video but you don't need to do stuff sequentially. You can stop, you can have a look at the code. And when I say have a look at the code, currently I'm only sharing one screen, so I do it a little bit sequentially. I can also go here and um, have here uh, the resources. When I click here on this Jupyter Notebook, it takes a few seconds because in the background now, in our back end, technologically speaking, uh, JupyterLab is opened, 
which is called here portal. And you see this is already from a while back. <laughs> Finance doesn't change that often and the Python code that is used here also didn't change uh, that much. And you see, just by clicking on it, I now have Finance with Python demo, which accompanies um, this, um, this one video where I just clicked on the companies and I'm here in the game. So this was now from the first one. I can go to Finance with Python, example here, Finance with Python. Three, and I can open another one here. So there are all the resources. So um, this is relatively easy to find, I guess. <clears throat> and with regard to replacing them uh, for the time being, we will leave them here as they are, the original ones, and all recorded sessions will be posted in the live session classes. I can maybe show you this uh, briefly as well. So. Here we have uh, this class, Finance with Python. Uh, you have seen videos plus resources. There are also here and there are links uh, to slide decks that have been used. But under trainings, these are the ones here, Comfin Certificate Live Sessions and PyAlgo Certificate Live Sessions. There you find all the recordings, no matter for which class or which topic they are during the course of the program of the cohort. Um, this is the place or these are the two places where you will find the live sessions and later on they will be replaced and, and uh, reorganized. But from our experience to have the, the recent recordings in a single place in a single class is basically what has proven best. So you see here PyAlgo certificate live sessions, no module available, but once for example, we have uh, the recording of today's session available, this is exactly the place where you will find the recording of today's session. So. Here we have the codes, I have opened two, and you see they are not saving here, so in this context, because they are um, yeah, provided in a read-only fashion, but I show you also how you can, um, how you can save Jupyter Notebooks, but I show you this in the context. Um, here this is the training, but the other resources are found under courses. Under courses you also find FinPy, and when I navigate to FinPy, you see here are six Jupyter Notebooks. And these Jupyter Notebooks are now exactly those notebooks which are used to write the chapters of the book. There are six chapters and you'll find six notebooks there. We are here in the context of chapter four. So if you want to have exactly the code that is used here, then you go on the uh, Quant Lab, uh, sorry, here on the portal. You go to FinPy04, and this is the Jupyter Notebook, which is the relevant one for Chapter 4, Optimality and Equilibrium. And you see now a quick comparison. Here, def you see, and down here until the optimal function value of 25. And when I go and compare this, you see this is exactly the code that you see here, right? From start to this point that I'm showing here, this is now what I've opened. Again, I cannot save this. Um, it doesn't allow you to save it, but if you want to, well, yeah, for example, do some changes, some additions, or want to have your own copy to work with, you can go to File, Save Notebook As. This is also explained in the intro and overview video. And then you see here is the path, and I can simply delete what is up front here, finpy04.ipynb, just in the root folder, you see here is the slash, that's important. And now I'm not working with a read-only version, when I go to the top level, you see now that finpy04 appears here in my personal root folder, and here I can now do whatever I would like to do. For example, say um, this, this is, just a simple change of the notebook. And this is now something you can save here. You see here with a dot, it's not saved, but when I use command S, I can save it here. That's my word. So for example, let's say you wanna put some comments in here, you wanna work with different numbers, you wanna change the examples, um, you wanna rerun the whole thing then afterwards. So this works here. So I can, for example, restart the kernel and run it all. So now, these are relatively simple notebooks. They execute 
um, quite quickly. And you see, I've just now re-executed the whole thing. So this is now your version. I've shown you how to do this. When you uh, access resources that are read-only, you just go to File, Save Notebook S, and then you need to adjust the path to your um, uh, root path. Right? So that's the idea of how to work with the resources. Also in courses, something that is asked quite regularly, let's stick to FinPy for this week. Uh, I know many of you want to have PDFs. We don't provide PDFs for uh, every single um, tax, but for FinPy, there is the FinPy course PDF. When I double click here, this is a, uh, quite a bit of a larger PDF <laughs> with all the graphics, etc. And this is password protected. Everybody has received the password. And when I now type in the password, then I have also access here to the um, PDF file. This is something that you can download and use, for example, also on a, on a, on a, on a pad like iPad or other uh, pads if you uh, yeah, prefer to read it locally. I don't recommend to print it uh, because uh, this is all in flux typically. There are uh, many updates, etc., going on. So printing it out um, might probably leave you with um, a quickly outdated version in particular, since I'm currently writing and um, working on this particular um, book here, the Finance with Python 1. So when you're finished with that, obviously you can close it, but you can also download it by a left click example here and then you go to download and you can save it uh, for local usage right so these are the basics um, to work with the platform of course um, when you want to work on exercises and want to try out things you can also here you see there is a launcher and i can say well uh, please open um, a new uh, notebook so i import numpy as np our major tool for numerical computing and then maybe we draw some random numbers right so of course you can use this to create new uh, Jupyter notebooks on your own you can also use it to open the terminal um, this is a unix based environment you see there are uh, this anaconda which was used to install uh, notebooks is your working directory so i would go to uh, probably to notebooks to work there and you see here is my finpy 04 and the untitled one that i've just created in all the other resources so for those of you who know already how to work on uh, the best shell uh, with linux uh, this is your go-to uh, place and for everybody else be assured after we are through the program, you will feel like an expert in this regard as well. So we cover the details required in this context in the program. For the beginning, this is nothing to worry about. I just wanted to show that you have um, the um, capabilities or to use something like HTOP to control the resources um, of your Docker container. So everybody's working here in um, their own Docker container and um, we also even show you how to set something like this up in your own docker uh, container yeah this should finish it so here untitled um, this was just a little test if i don't need this anymore i would say example here delete yeah i want to delete it this was also just a copy i can um, delete this also without risk and i'm back in the original state so that much about JupyterLab on the platform here the resources and i have shown you um i have shown you also the um the videos here under trainings where we have the current videos but uh it can be relaxed we have live sessions uh, with new versions of uh, all of this um in this week and next week yeah that much about the quant platform at this point in time. So I said, after we are through the program, you will feel like an expert on the shell. And I think that's pretty much true. And among others, the tools and skills class is your um, helper, your, your bridge in this regard, if you are not yet an expert in uh, this area. So we cover uh, yeah, all the required tools and skills to yeah, set up a proper 
Python environment for Python development, as well as deployment, for example, in the cloud. So we cover the basics of Python installation environments on Mac and Linux, as well as on Windows. Uh, Docker usage, uh, including Jupyter Notebook Lab on Mac, Linux, and Windows, as well as cloud usage from Mac, Linux, as well as Windows. And as we go, we will cover here and there additional basic Linux tools and shell basics, uh, but the focus will be on the following tools. WIM for quote-unquote universal code editing. So I use WIM on every platform, be it um, on Linux, be it on uh, Mac or on Windows. A WIM as an editor is available in all environments. And even if it might not be my major editor, for example, when writing a book, but for quickly editing code and working, let's say, uh, on a cloud server, uh, this comes in pretty handy. And when we then combine Win, Win with uh, Screen, Session Manager, and Q, a little tiny Python package, we have what I call a lightweight tool chain for editing, logging, and debugging. So I'm a big fan of that because A, it is installed within uh, minutes, if not seconds, and it's pretty lightweight. So this is like, it comes out of the box. It has um, a panel screen management, um, comparable to more sophisticated uh, local environments, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, bear a little bit <laughs> with us. Uh, this will come early enough for you to be uh, productive and ready to get used to it. Uh, then we also cover doc tests and unit tests, an important topic, Git version control, um, which might in the beginning not be the most important topic, but later on um, might be uh, pretty helpful. For example, also in a corporate context or when you want to work on a larger project and want to uh, properly manage versions of your project or want to work together, collaborate with others. This is something that uh, comes in pretty handy. And if you then go one step further and want to distribute your Python code uh, in the form of a package, let's say, we cover here how Python packaging works on a basic level, also how to uh, come up with a proper modern documentation, how to host the code, uh, let's say on GitHub, or with, of course, additional alternatives available, but GitHub is and remains the most popular um, site. And then we have also a case study, which tries to combine all the other tools into a single um, coherent case study so that you see how the single elements interact with each other. And what we do there is, um, yeah, work with Jupyter Notebooks, Terminal Editor, IPython Wim on every infrastructure. So what we cover will be repeated a couple of times, but in different contexts. Of course, we need Python on the programming level. Um, there might be a Docker container involved. There's no necessity for that. And uh, we will also learn how to put all this into the cloud. In particular, when you deploy your algorithmic trading strategies, uh, you should do this on a proper, uh, reliable, robust infrastructure. And these days, there is no argument, from my point of view, against deployment in the cloud, because um, you can get started with five US dollar per month um, so this is, uh, uh, for sure, I would say if somebody wants to do proper algo trading, this uh, can't be a barrier of entry in this uh, context. Uh, also here, you will find videos plus additional resources, maybe a little bit differently structured and prepared than, um, than uh, for the other classes, because here we provide more scripts and and cheat sheets for the different tools, etc. So, but um, this gets started from uh, early on, and you will have exposure um, from a, a basic level, a gentle introduction to the more advanced topics as we go through the program. And then we have the Python for Financial Data Science class, which is based on my book, Python for Finance, and in particular on the first 13 chapters in this context. Um, and this is about all the approaches, um, yeah, also yeah, tools to some extent, but primarily about the packages. Uh, that's the focus here that are so helpful and maybe even required to do proper Python for finance. So we get started with the basic Python data uh, types and structures. We then uh, introduce thoroughly NumPy, uh, move on to uh, data analysis with pandas, OOP is introduced, not on an expert level, but I think on, on, a, on a work level uh, that should be enough for the other uh, instances where you might want to work with OOP in the program or 
should work with it. We then have the data science focus, uh, visualization, financial time series, input output operations, of course, efficient ones. And Python, I think, is a master in the field of uh, performant IO operations, as well as performance Python. So when I got into the Python ecosystem, I heard it. Uh, it feels like on a daily basis, the Python is too slow for finance here and there. I think we have a, we have come a long way and we have fantastic performance packages and libraries available which allow to come up with uh, Python code in certain instances, which is comparable to C code and uh, for sure for yeah comparable to the performance of other languages such as uh, Julia. Uh, not in every instance, but uh, I would say in many, many instances with the, the elegance and con concise approach of Python itself. And then a little bit more mathematics about mathematical tools such as um, uh, SumPy, differentiation, integration um, <laughs> on the command line, quote unquote, stochastic simulation, risk management, value at risk, uh, statistics and machine learning. And last but not least, we have dates and time. Uh, which are so important in the financial uh, domain. So statistics and machine learning here is meant as more an introductory um, session. We have uh, throughout the program from start to finish many, many resources which are related to machine learning, AI in general, and AI and reinforcement learning um, applied to the financial domain. Yeah, the resources are similar. So you have uh, the reading. Not the book itself, not a PDF, but you have the HTML version uh, of the 13 chapters. You have the recordings, you have Jupyter notebooks and maybe other files, data files, code files or whatever uh, that accompany the sessions. Plus you have, of course, the single Jupyter notebooks that you can execute on um, the, the Quant platform in the Jupyter lab uh, part in this context. So uh, this is the typical, uh, triangle of resources that I mentioned in the context of finance with Python. Then Python for Excel, this is one of the optional resources. Again, I think uh, that not everybody is uh, primarily interested in, in using Excel, uh, but many in a corporate context are, and this is a class uh, where uh, we show how to combine Excel beneficially with the analytical power of Python. So just think of a powerful and simple, straightforward replacement of VBA with Python, with all the wonderful things that it can do in Python, but which might be triggered and displayed and, 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 and yeah, um, how should I say, coordinated from the Excel level. Isn't it wonderful to say, well, I click a button and then there are some um, yeah, sophisticated um, analytic steps involved in the back end, and I'm not even taking care on the Excel level um, about this, uh, or think of machine learning applied to data that you have in Excel or whatever. So the, the, the application areas are basically limitless, and it works to a large extent on uh, Mac as well, but not to 100%. So in order to benefit uh, yeah, completely from what Python can do for Excel, a Windows environment is required, but uh, let's say 60% uh, can also be harnessed on a Mac um, installation. Python for databases. Um, finance is a data-driven discipline these days, and therefore, no wonder databases play an important role. Um, we cover in this optional class um, SQL and no SQL databases as well as Python specific. So there is some MySQL, there's SQLite, MongoDB as an object-oriented store, PyTables as a hierarchical database for binary storage, SQL Alchemy as an abstraction layer for um, SQL-based um, backends, as well as Beacult as a columnar data store. So all fantastic solutions. Maybe not every single one as before is of importance for your um, specific uh, goals or your, your work environment, let's say. But I think no matter what your use case is, you will find one or the other solution, which might prove helpful. Here again, the resources are structured a little bit differently. We provide, of course, videos, additional resources, explanations, etc. But uh, here the focus lies on uh, helping you to install everything in the cloud. So therefore this starts a little bit later. 
once you have had exposure and a little bit of uh, experience with setting up a cloud infrastructure. Uh, because if you want to install everything that's required, for example, with the MySQL, etc., this is quite involved, and we, we simply want to avoid that uh, anything your local setup uh, will be messed up with, right? So, uh, but you will see what I mean later on when you dive into that. Then we have an admittedly brief class, uh, two recorded sessions about natural language processing. Maybe we could um, add in the future a little bit to that. But with these two sessions, we cover already quite a bit of ground, uh, if not 80%, but maybe a little bit over 50% of the most useful things that you can work with in this area. And it helps you, for example, with summarization of texts. With uh, I do it every once in a while when I have a couple of research papers. I simply uh, transform PDFs into text uh, or HTML and then use an NLP with Python uh, to come up with word cloud summarizations and, and stuff like that, right? Just to automate a couple of things that might be helpful. Um, I, I wish I would have had something like this when I was uh, back at university. That's for sure. Uh, but we've come a long way and today we can benefit from these fantastic new technologies and obviously um, we have uh, i would say quite a bit more unstructured data uh, in this world in, on the web in particular that we have structured data in the form of numbers and there are, is already quite a bit of uh, yeah of data um, in the form of of numbers like time series data cross-sectional data etc available um, so we are talking about petabytes and petabytes of data out there um, but again, Python again here is one of the go-to languages uh, at all. If you want to do proper NLP, Python is pretty fast in this context. And I think we have uh, the right programming language here to help us with not only crunching numbers, but with also um, crunching uh, unstructured data like texts in this context. So then we come to one of the core topics, uh, artificial intelligence in finance. It has become so important in the field and there's quite a bit of hype. And, and I like to say that we are still here at the nascent stage. So there have been um, yeah, maybe a number already, uh, admittedly, of uh, yeah, success stories in the field. Not as successful as when you think back in terms of Alpha Zero or whatever uh, you're aware of or Alpha Go, so to say, where there's a Netflix documentary for the success but there are already success stories but still i feel that we are pretty much at the beginning of all this um and this is uh yeah my former beginning if you like uh my take on ai and finance with a focus is a couple of hundred hundreds of pages and still i focus only on one particular part uh, which is related to algorithmic trading in this um in this book here so there are many many other areas like in computation finance you might have heard of deep hatching for example or in the areas um, of credit scoring or fraud detection etc there are many useful application areas which are yeah more or less uh, revolutionized we can already say quite now by the application of ai techniques and uh, we would see uh, more um progress in this regard in the near future. So I think it's the right time to get deep into this particular topic. Um, because when we think in terms of financial markets, um, we can think of uh, yeah, financial markets as a huge abstract data processing engine, right? So we have X, which stands here for input data, and we have Y, which is the output data. Let's say this is some news, some political news, business news, uh, economic news, um, whatever it might be and the markets process it and we see the results in the form of adjusted prices index levels etc but the way this happens uh, is for sure non-linear it's complex it's changing over time so in other words we are not dealing with the physical world where in the physical world um at least to a large extent once we have found a law um like F equals M times A or E equals MC squared or whatever jumps to mind in the physical world. This is usually there to stay forever. <laughs> Once there's proof for that, mathematical proof, and it relates to physical reality, then it's there to stay forever. In finance, I think the world is a little bit different. So when you pick up a finance book uh, today, uh, many of the theories have been in finance books already at the end of the 60s, 70s, 80s, etc. So uh, people... Brilliant people have come up with what I call normative economics approaches where they assumed how people might behave, 
or assumed how markets should behave, etc. Then they came up with simple, elegant theories. Just think of the capital asset pricing model or the many other uh, simplified theories. They usually rely on two major assumptions, that relationships are linear, A, eh? and that returns or other quantities are normally distributed. But both of these assumptions are in general wrong. Therefore, um, these elegant, nice theories, which I'm a big fan of, really, I, I love traditional finance, don't get me wrong in this regard, but most of these fantastic uh, theories, elegant theories, have hardly any supporting empirical evidence. Um, so this didn't work uh, basically from the beginning. So it's not that uh, something has changed later on, uh, even from the outset, there has been hardly any supporting evidence, for example, for the capital asset pricing model. The, model, the, the words are simply more complex than uh, returns of stocks. Let me think of Apple might be explained by um, the return of uh, the major market index and the linear relationship. Um, so this doesn't really work. So therefore, with AI and finance, we can get back to positive economics. We say, well, let's get started with the data and let's figure out relationships that might be in the data. So we are more like physicists doing an experiment. And then we apply general parameterizable trainable algorithms. This is now the AI part. And we might come up with some complex neural network, a number of hidden layers, many, many hidden units, etc., cetera, um, which might not be as elegant and as concise as the uh, traditional or regional finance theory, but which might be better in practice. And if you ask me whether I would prefer a simple, elegant theory or a little bit more complex one, which I don't fully understand, I would prefer the complex black box if it makes me money as compared to the elegant simple theory, which I fully understand, but which is not in accordance with reality. So that's the basic idea from my personal point of view behind AI in finance. Uh, on a more practical level, this is yet another class, and we have two classes. When we get to the study plan, I will explain this again. So we have one class. This was uh, the starting point with the formal AI in finance class where the focus lies really on yeah, starting from scratch and, and building bottom up many models based on Python code. So this is really like you go to resource um, the original artificial intelligence in finance class. Um, when you say, well, I'm really interested in how new networks work, what backwards propagation is, how this uh, yeah, translates into practical applications, etc. the basics also of the single packages to be applied. So this is your go-to resource. But there's also another class, which we did in the last round, which relates to the new version or the final version, so to say, of the book. So you have like for going forward for the next uh, 12 weeks, you have uh, the major class, which is a recommended uh, resource and uh, which is called AI and Finance Book. And you have the original class where it all got started, uh, which is an optional resource. So for those of you who are interested in particular in this field, uh, you might want to uh, follow along the two of them in this uh, context. We have also added recently a separate class for reinforcement learning because I think it's not only myself uh, who is so fascinated with reinforcement learning for finance, but many, many others as well. And we just recently had the first final projects um, in this field. And uh, when I said AI and finance is at an nascent stage, I think this is even before that. So this is like an exploratory stage, I would say, but nevertheless, a fascinating one. Fascinating for me because um, one of the first success stories in this context was by DeepMind in the context of playing Atari games and later on AlphaGo, but playing Atari with deep reinforcement learning. When I was growing up, this was one of the first consoles to play a card games back home. And I was so intrigued by that, like everybody else my age, I think. And suddenly DeepMind comes around the corner and they have an AI agent, a reinforcement, deep reinforcement learning agent who plays these games at superhuman levels just by playing the games and learning game for game for game. This was so intriguing. The same approach was then used, of course, much refined for AlphaGo and later for Alpha Zero. What we are going to cover, and um, I think a little bit of fun um, has its place here as well, are a couple of games based on the open AI gym environment. Uh, card pole as a simple entry game, then we have the mountain car game, and a little bit more complex and not that easy to solve um, as the others is Lunar Lander, a game that I recall playing myself back then as well. So here, gaming and a little bit of fun 
um, is also included uh, in the reinforcement learning class. Of course, with the goal, once we have understood the approaches and have code available, which is able to uh, learn uh, playing of these games, that we can then benefit from the experience and um, go to um, go to the financial side of things. So here I have, there are links behind that um, where there are recordings. So here's a lunar lander. You see how this works. This lunar lander thing there, it's not probably the best agent. It takes quite a bit and a while. It's not like a perfect agent, which immediately lands the spaceship properly between the two yellow flags. So, um, here you see it takes quite a bit, but uh, I think it's fun to see how an agent can learn how to fly such a, a spaceship with this inter in this interactive environment, and then how we translate all this into trading in the financial markets. Pretty pretty fascinating still for me when I see this. So you see this is a slow agent, takes quite a bit, but in the end, uh, now I think and landing and it's not crashing that's the basic idea and it comes to rest um between the two flags here in this context so there are links um, to these little uh, demos uh, in the slide deck as well also for mountain view maybe maybe we have a quick look now that i'm getting so excited when i talk about this this is a little bit uh, more easy here it's just a momentum game right i need to push as hard as I can to the left to get enough potential energy, which is translated into momentum. And then the goal here is to get out of the screen, so to say, to reach the yellow flag on the right. So when you get started with that, uh, it's not as easy as it looks uh, right here, but it's also a good starting uh, point to learn about reinforcement learning. Yeah, this is what to expect in this class. Um, the resources themselves are then, quote unquote, more standard um, videos, um, the uh, notebooks, as well, of course, as the stored notebooks on the uh, Jupyter Lab site here in this context. So uh, this is all available on the platform as all the others. And you see the subtitle here from playing games to trading in the financial markets. Now coming to the core classes. Um, I wouldn't say that the core class is based on the book. The book is an outgrowth of what we have been teaching over the years, but we have more in um, the program to offer than what is to be found in the book. You see here, the, the, for the core classes, I have listed again here, uh, finance with Python, finance with Python. So for everything that follows, it is expected that you have a good grasp of these topics as well as a general class that we have um, for the introduction uh, yeah, part during the first three weeks, financial data science. Then we come to the topics themselves, like vectorized backtesting, prediction-based trading, where we apply machine learning, deep learning um, in this context to come up with strategies. We then introduce event-based backtesting to have a little bit more flexibility. And then algo trading itself. So up until that point, we just deal with data and ideas and do some backtesting, but there is a point in time when you say, well, now let's go live. And at that point, you need to be able to deal with real-time data and streaming data, also maybe with uh, streaming visualization. In this context, uh, we cover four platforms, Wanda, FXCM, Interactive Brokers, and Gemini. And we put it all together in the automation and review part, um, where we say, well, now let's put it all together um, do some backtesting um, uh, thoroughly and uh, work with the platform, um, transform our offline strategy as it's called to an online one, which is applicable and deployable in a real time context and all the elements that come at the end and that's, uh, that are so important are then you put together in automation and review. Then we have the practice modules where you should come up with your own strategy, then the practice module two, which is about deployment. And based on your experience in this context, uh, you might then be ready to come up with your final project, which is a research paper. There is nothing to be done here about deployment. It's actually forbidden um, to do something with APIs or deployment. It must be uh, reproducible from A to Z. Here, my pyramid that I use since years, and I haven't seen any reason or incentive so far to change it. So we start with the infrastructure for everything. 
financial data is required, otherwise uh, everything will be shallow. Uh, strategy code uh, is to be formulated, backtesting code is to be added to the mix, and the connecting code to the markets where we uh, then interact with the yeah with the real time world with streaming data we then need to be able to execute trades this is what is meant by trading codes and last but not least all this needs to be put together into a coherent uh yeah python code base that we can deploy in the cloud and this is then shown here in the form of integrated case studies so then we have also an wonder masterclass so wonder is um uh, indeed a focal point in this context because from my point of view they have the best technological infrastructure um, and there might be a path for uh, those of you who are really eager uh, to become uh, early adopters uh, testers beta testers for our platform but more on this later on first the program and then we discuss these topics if of interest at all python for computational finance that's the other core class this is about options keep it short options and derivatives right and this is primarily based on my book derivatives on addiction of python right hand side you see the um, chinese translation of the book um, and we have these topics here so we have the basics about market-based valuation everything um, that you have learned in finance with python comes in handy here for this and when i say finance with python is expected for the python for algorithmic trading class this holds true even more so for computational finance. So um, indeed, finance with Python must be there as a basis when we get into the world of computational finance, because here we skip over the basics, at least to some extent, uh, or I'd rather say we don't spend too much time on the basics, uh, to put it that way. Therefore, finance with Python should be there already. We cover complete market models like uh, Black Scholes Merton, Coxus Rubin, Stein here, uh, binomial option pricing, risk neutral valuation, a more general framework which originated in the end, at the end of the 70s. Um, for year pricing is introduced for yeah, efficient um, calibration approaches. Uh, we then cover American options based on Monte Carlo simulation, uh, numerically quite involved topic. General market model is covered, which means a model which allows for stochastic short rates, stochastic volatility, also jump components. So that's really um, yeah, at the core, because from that point on, everything else is based on this general market model or some that model, some specific version of the general market model. And uh, we come on Monte Carlo simulation then, efficient Monte Carlo simulation, of course, calibration of these models, hatching strategies based on numerics. And we do some review and also have a practice in this um, in this uh, context. That is a, a good question which relates to uh, Pargo uh, trading. What's the difference between step-by-step -step and um, and uh, the platform, uh, the AI machine? Uh, yeah, to, to keep it short at this stage, uh, more on this uh, later on in the program. The AI machine is basically when you have a strategy and you want to have standardized robust deployment you formulate your strategy on the AI machine and you have a one-click deployment when you do it step by step and this is what i would require from everybody who wants to work with the machine to understand what's involved uh, you need to take care of so many things that the platform takes care of right so it's a little bit like we teach you how to build a car but you can also of course go to a car dealership and say i want to buy uh, this used car uh, at a cheap price and that's uh, exactly what i've been looking for and then you drive away with it but we more or less have the idea that first you need to master the skills you need to understand what's involved and then you can properly work with the platform like the engine that's that's at a, as a quick um, um excursion here from computational finance back to pi algo trading yeah computational finance but that's not all so to say we in the last cohort have introduced um basically for the first time although this book is available uh, since a couple of years one of my quant finance books we have for the first time had uh, a class about list of volatility and variance zero it was a very interesting topic for those of you and particular now that we have seen what uh, happened in 2020 where volatility again spiked to levels we've never seen before and um 
yeah, this becomes so important as a risk management tool and, and also as an asset class for sure. Um, I thought this would be so timely and we had a, a couple of fans of the topic that said, well, yeah, we would be interested in. That's the reason why we just added this class in the last cohort. So this class is about trading volatility and variance as an asset class. So we have an introduction there into the world of derivatives, volatility and variance. Uh, the core topic here is the model-free replication of variance. We then cover volatility products in detail, but first volatility itself. Uh, we've got the data analysis strategies and the VStox index. Um, this is all based um, on European derivatives, but the VStox index has the same definition. It works the very same way as the VIX, for example, as well as for the other instruments written on the index. So when you read VStox from a, a theoretical conceptual point of view, it can replace it by VIX. In this context, then valuing volatility derivatives, also advanced modeling of the VSTOX index using um, yeah, jump components as well. Then variants, realized variants and the variant swaps, um, quite popular, not as uh, listed um, uh, derivatives, but over the counter for sure. Variance futures at the Eurex uh, in Europe. And then we also apply DX analytics in this context, my uh, package for pricing uh, options and, and complex uh, portfolios uh, composed of derivatives, right, based on square root diffusion and square root jump diffusion. And we then have a couple of add-on topics here in this uh, context that are not at the core, I would say, but which uh, come in handy if you want to review certain elements. So not a brand new class, but a new new class from the previous cohort. DX analytics, I mentioned before, um, is something that we cover in detail, in much more detail than in Alpha4D. Uh, in the LVVD class, Alpha4D was German, so in the LVVD class, list of volatility and variance, derivatives class, and um, this is basically in line with the core computational finance class. So basics with a quick start, the framework, European valuation, portfolios, Fourier pricing, American valuations, so classic short rates, derivatives portfolios is something that returns after we have added additional twists um, to our modeling capabilities. And then we have some specials there like multi-risk derivatives, implied volatilities, calibration, hedging, and uh, last but not least, complex portfolios modeled and valued with uh, DX analytics. So that's a class that goes in parallel with the core class in computational finance uh, based on the book derivatives analytics with Python. Here you see the, yeah, the, the schema which explains the idea of DX analytics. It's about the risk neutral present values and creeks for instruments, positions and portfolios. We only have Monte Carlo simulation as the major numerical method. Other uh, methods are quote unquote only helper methods such as for year pricing. For example, we have forward simulation, backwards uh, propagation for the um, evaluation. We have the non-redundant modeling of risk factors. We can have multiple derivatives, simple ones, um, or multi-risk derivatives, European exercise, um, American exercise, plain vanilla payoffs, uh, <laughs> complex non-standard uh, payoffs. We then can model positions as well as compose portfolios thereof and, and take into account net payoffs. So risk neutral discount curve can be constant deterministic or stochastic. So more on this, this looks maybe a little bit complicated, but um, the single elements will be explained in detail in this particular part. Yet another pyramid, this time we have eight topics, all start with the infrastructure. If we don't have Python, if we don't have the DX analytics pa package, NumPy, Pandas, etc., it doesn't work. We also need financial data. Um, we need the models themselves. We need to be able to simulate the models efficiently. Fourier pricing is an important numerical method which helps us with the calibration of the different models, so it helps us in terms of speed, efficiency. And this allows us after calibration to come up with market-based valuations. And last but not least, uh, in turn, this allows us to also do uh, proper numerical hatching based on the calibrated market uh, consistent models. Yeah, now it's time for um, some quick demos. I said it already before, this is not meant to be a training session. Um, this is just uh, meant for you to uh, gain a little bit more insight into what to expect as well as to whet your appetite. 
So don't try to follow along in this context. I have already shown a little bit about the quant platform. So I will therefore jump into the second point here, Python with Docker. And I just want to show you if you've never heard of Docker, if you've never used it, if you know what maybe with Linux, that it's all but a secret actually to get into that. So I have already prepared here a terminal window. And you see there is a command docker run minus ti minus h third uh, minus v. <laughs> uh, this is currently not the important part. So everything is explained in detail. The only thing that needs to uh, be uh, assured is that docker is a installed and running. So here you see uh, docker desktop is running. So without that, I couldn't do what I'm now going to do. And if you wonder what docker is, if you've never heard, of, maybe you've heard of it, but I haven't had any exposure to it. This allows me personally now here on my local machine to run a Linux operating system and uh, our go-to choice is Ubuntu on a Mac OS. So you recall when I said uh, JupyterLab on the Quant platform is uh, provided to everybody of you within a Docker environment, I now do the same quote unquote here locally. So when I execute this line of command here, Docker run, etc., you see it suddenly says root cert. So before I was in the Mac world, Mac live is the folder if I'm the user, right? And work is my conda environment. Now I'm in the Linux environment. So you see typical folders for those of you who have experience with Linux, that's like uh, second home. I would say um, uh, for those not, uh, again, <laughs> my, my forecast is that after the program, you will feel like home here as well. I now navigate to the root folder. So I'm locked in here as the administrator, the root. This is, so to say, the master of the system. So I go to root and given my command, how I started the... Um, how I started this it was a little bit quick. You see, I have one folder here mounted and this is from my local system. So when I look up what is in there, it is live. So these are a couple of Jupyter notebooks that I want to show you later on for the demo. Currently, we shouldn't be too concerned with that. So when I type in Python here, it says Python not found. So my major goal here is to come up with a proper Python environment that would allow me to do some Finance with Python and Python for Finance, <laughs> to keep it simple to these uh, two topics. So uh, first of all, what I need to do in general is uh, an update of the package index. This is something like on Windows where you say check for updates. Then I do the update, up, get upgrade. So it now says, well, there's a bunch of things uh, that can be upgraded. Do you want to do so? Yes. Uh, and again, this might now be fast, but it's just to to illustrate it, not to um, teach it, nor for you to understand or follow along. Now I have done my housekeeping. Next thing that I need is I need to retrieve a Python installer. Um, and to this end, I need a tool which is called um, wget. Oh, I need to, of course, type in install, upget install wget. Install says, to the package manager that I want to install a certain package. Wget, when it exists, is then here looked up and I'm prompted whether I indeed want to proceed. And I now have Wget. And this is a tool that allows me to retrieve remote resources. And here I want to work with Miniconda. This is something that we use throughout the program. Um, it is a package manager, it's a minimal Python installation, and it also allows us to manage environments. So, uh, this all is explained in detail in, for example, tools and skills, but in other places as well. You see here there are Windows installers, macOS installers, but now, recall, I'm in a Linux environment. So here Python 3.8, there's also the option 3.7, but I go with the uh, 3.8, 64-bit, copy link address. And now I can say that's the reason why I installed uh, wget. I paste here the link and I'm going to retrieve a package. It's, I don't know, 119, uh, 89 max, depending on the speed of the internet connection. This might take a little bit longer or might even be faster, right? And I now have this available here, mini condo, right? So I'm doing this AN. Whenever I look here at the fold, you see there are also some hidden files. 
but this is the large file here, the installer, and here we see uh, the size, 94 max, something like that. So now I executed bash miniconda, and this will install Python. In order to continue the installation process, please review the agreement. I've done this a couple of times, so I don't need to read through this um, here in detail. I simply jump through the text and I say, yes, I agree to the licensing terms. Now it prompts me where to install miniconda. I simply go with the suggestion, root miniconda3. What's now going on is that it installs Python plus a bunch of other things. So you see here SQLite, this is a SQL database, batteries included with Python, and a couple of other things, OpenSSL, so for uh, encrypted communication, for example. Now it says, it asks me whether to uh, initialize Miniconda, I say yes, and thank you for installing Miniconda. You see, this was a quick affair, I would guess, right? And when I now type Python, it's not yet there, so my major goal not yet achieved. What I need to do, I need to restart my bash shell by typing bash, and you notice immediately it now says base. Before it was just root at third, now it says base root at third. And I can do stuff like conda and list, and it shows me the environments. Base, you see here conda environments, base is there, and it has installed. Python in this context. When I now type Python, suddenly I have Python, right? Hello world. And my first line of Python code, my hello world example, right? So I can exit this, so typically we won't use it. And I can now use Conda to install other packages. IPython, NumPy, um, no, I, I go with it, um, and maybe also JupyterLab. So IPython is a tool, JupyterLab is a tool, NumPy is a package. Uh, more details as usual, I repeat myself. I just want to make sure uh, that you don't think you're missing out on something here. Uh, Conda install IPython NumPy JupyterLab, and it now connects to the server, checks for IPython NumPy JupyterLab, and it comes back with a list of packages that it asks me whether indeed they all should be installed. Because when I install NumPy, for example, or JupyterLab is an even better example, it's not only that JupyterLab gets installed, you see there are a bunch of packages. This is what are called dependencies or requirements for certain packages. So I say yes, and it's now downloading stuff. Again, speed of the internet connection plays a role here. For example, this one package, 130 max, it's a little bit larger, and it's done. So now let's check. I said Python is typically not what we use, but IPython is something that I use pretty regularly. This gives me also a Python interpreter here, Python 3.8.5, and interactive, so print. Hello, quant world, and my first line. You see, among others, that I now have numbered input prompts compared to before, and I have syntax highlighting here. Print hello, quant world. Obviously highlighted in green and in brown or whatever this is, beige. And I have installed NumPy, so import NumPy SNP, for example, and NP random dot random, maybe 10. 19, I don't care. <laughs> I draw 19 random numbers. So NumPy is there, IPython is there. So I have already accomplished uh, quite a bit in this regard. Um, and you recall, I've shown you a couple of times how to open a Jupyter notebook, uh, Jupyter lab on a quant platform. But now I'm basically only one command away from having the same here. Um, I can start Jupyter lab. Here I need to add a few little twists explained later on. Uh, port 999, this is something I specified and I need to allow root. This is to circumvent a certain security mechanism here. So I have installed JupyterLab, I hope it runs and it runs here. And I see here the line that is of interest. So that's the URLs that I need and let me use this tab. I don't need the installer anymore. And now I'm 
opening Jupyter Lab here in the browser. This is within my Docker container from my Linux Ubuntu environment. And you see I'm up and running. And here, this is a folder that I have mounted to my container. These are the other notebooks that I'm going to show you afterwards. And when I open, for example, the first, you can see my Jupyter notebook opens. I cannot really execute it right now because I've only installed NumPy. Uh, here you see this uh, requires pandas and matplotlib and a couple of other things. But with, uh, with regard to the tool, we are good to go. So I'm going to discard the changes. You can also edit text here. So I see this is an, um, a markdown document that I use um, to share the uh, gist, the resources with you all. Um, and you see, I can do some text editing. And as before, I've shown it on the Quant platform. You can go here also and have in the um, shell in, in one tab here, you have um, the, um, the terminal. So when I want to call HTOP, it's not installed. So I can from here, what I do, what I did before, app get install HTOP. It's another package like wget. And when I now call HTOP, you see I can manage my resources. So I have uh, six cores here. Um, the memory that's allocated is two gigs of RAM and I see all the processes here running. Like a matter of minutes, and within a Docker container, I've installed Python, uh, IPython, JupyterLab, and have done already my first uh, things here with JupyterLab. Just for illustration, this is all what you will learn and what will become, I'm pretty sure, second nature once you have gone through tools and skills and the other parts of the program. So I can leave this in the background, I can leave it running, no. Um, no problem with that, but I now go to a local Jupyter lab. So what I've done here in a fast fashion, I have of course here already pre-prepared and, and, and yeah, by default uh, installed on my MacBook. And I can now open this notebook that I've shown you uh, before briefly. And here I can execute it because everything else that is required is installed there as well. And this is a little demo notebook about the efficient market hypothesis, uh, random walks couple of quotes. Again, I'm not going to spend now that much time. I just want to show you when I walk through this notebook, I retrieve here um, data. This is a standard data set that I use regularly with a couple of um, name symbols or RICs as they're called in the refinitive world in here. Um, so this is data of 10 years worth of end of day data. So standard data set, also from the Python 5 trading book. I calculate some log returns, daily log returns. These are small numbers. I plot the data here. You see, this is nicely plotted with Plotly interactively. So I can even go, for example, and uh, turn off Amazon and maybe Apple. So you see immediately it, it's dynamically adjusted. You see, for example, here, um, the the VIX um, on the in the rebased way, for example, over time. So I can uh, click out or I can zoom in. This is all uh, fantastic with iPlot. Uh, with with sorry, with uh, yeah, iPlot is the call here, but with Plotly is the package and Cufflinks is the package on top of that, which makes it all available. So I can also plot histograms for all my. Uh, easily for all my uh, calculated log returns. Um, what is also nice usually is the correlation, the heat map here are the correlations. You see like uh, one, of course, every instrument has a perfect correlation with itself. There's not that much of an inside, but you see, for example, that the VIX is not that much correlated, uh, basically not at all uh, here um, or it's wrong what I said, so my wording was wrong. So we see here the lowest the lowest correlation, which means is is not zero. I mean, if, if I would say not correlated, it would mean zero. But when I see white here, this is like close to minus one. So that's now um, it's it's uh, highly negatively correlated here in this context. Um, so easy to generate heat maps. I'm preparing lag data, something we will repeat over and over again. We will work pretty regularly with, with uh, lag data um, in this context. So where we say, well, if we want to predict the Apple stock price, we, for example, work with 
seven historical lags in the tradition of technical analysts, where you say, well, we have a look at the historical price formation. Uh, we try to work with the price formation in order to predict next day's move in this context. So that's the that's the idea um, in this uh, context. So then we apply here a standard tool in econometrics, um, OLS regression. I do the regression here via a loop for all the instruments. Here you see the numbers printed out. And with regard to the efficient, efficient market hypothesis, what I emphasize typically here is that only lag one is important. Everything else is unimportant. This is uh, pretty much uh, visualized here, where you see when I have a look at the historical price formation. So lag one is last day's price, two days before, etc. cetera. Uh, what it shows here with ordinarily squares regression, there is, um, it's just lag one which plays a role. Everything else uh, doesn't play a role. Among others, uh, technically, this is due to the fact that these lags are, um, that we're dealing with non-stationary data and uh, the, the, the lags are highly correlated. But that's a different story and this is discussed in detail later on. So there is another uh, chart which now gives the averages or we can apply a more sophisticated uh, um, linear regression here in the form of um, the stats models, OLS, or normally squares regression. And you see we get a bunch of statistics here like R squared, adjusted R squared, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So just like to show this is something we cover in detail, efficient um, markets. Um, there's a question with regard to uh, getting uh, API data uh, from Icon for the next 12 weeks. Unfortunately, I don't have by default such uh, an option to provide you with um, access to that. But if they are more interested, basically you don't need it. You, you really don't need it to go through the program, not until week 12 or even beyond that. But I know that everybody's eager to get data. Um, and I also would say if you have 12 weeks access uh, to the data, what do you do afterwards, right? If you want to uh, deploy your code. But I can speak to my friends at uh, Refinitiv if there is some some easy way to uh, yeah get your hands on a, on a free trial in this context. I don't want to exclude it, uh, but I cannot uh, promise it because I don't have something here out of the box or any kind of agreement that I can share. Maybe you can ping me um, afterwards again and I try my best to get something uh, accomplished for you in this regard. Yeah, this was the first uh, Jupyter Notebook. So let me simply restart and clean it up. Then when we speak of efficient markets, we have two sides of a coin. The one side might represent the view of the financial engineer and financial modeler. The other side of the coin might be the view or represent the view of the algo trader. So when I'm a financial engineer and I'm like in option pricing, derivatives pricing, risk management, etc., I would say maybe, thank God, markets are efficient and this allows me to price complex options based on calibrated models. Because the basic idea is the market is always right. If I can figure out an, yeah, the, the, the proper martingale measure to speak technically, then I'm on a good path for like proper valuations and risk management strategy. So here, this is now the notebook from computational finance about a Merton jump diffusion model, where we simply take the financial engineer perspective, where we say, I don't go into the details here again, where I have this model, I have some initializations, and then I calibrate the model here based on a root mean squared error, where I say, well, I want to come up with parameters for the model that minimize the root mean squared error um, given the market prices of options. And typically you wouldn't deal here with a hundred options or multiple dozens of options, but a smaller subset, maybe three majorities and a bunch of options around the at the money uh, level, maybe forward at the money level, right? Here the example is based on euro stocks um, and I make a couple of assumptions. I work, as I said, with a smaller subset of options. You see the strikes, the call prices, the majority is data from 2014. Uh, the put prices are in there. And now I simply show here the call options. And the idea of calibration, there are maybe 
variants to that, but the idea is to come up with model parameters to best replicate these prices. So these are market prices. And in financial engineering, more often than not, you would say, well, I want to best replicate the prices of plain vanilla liquidly traded options to then go from there. So, and to this end, we define an error function. We get started with a global minimization where we scan the parameter surface. And it's taking a while. So we are doing here a bunch of revaluations. So hundreds of options are evaluated over and over again. So this takes a bit for sure. This is dependent on the hardware and on the number of options, on the methods that you use. Uh, the total length, of course, is also dependent on uh, the parameter ranges that you scan here. But that's not the big thing, right? And in the meantime, I know uh, I've been talking about ICOM, maybe a test access. Uh, where we are in the context of computational finance, uh, many people ask me, where do I get free data for options? So if it is already difficult to get free data, I mean, free alone, we are in the financial world, right? Uh, free alone has its, uh, at least its strings attached, uh, whatever they are. Um, but free options data is even more difficult to get. And even for like uh, trial accounts with, uh, with ICON, I would doubt that there is, uh, lots of option data available because there is simply there are different licensing models involved in this um, in this context which prohibit um, the widespread distribution of such data in this context. Yeah, so just to just as a word of of caution in this um, in this context. So after the global optimization, we go to local convex optimization. And we see that our root mean squared error is getting smaller and smaller. It's not zero, so we wouldn't expect a perfect result here. So after brute force, we have uh, 0 0.97, and after local optimization, 0 0.76. So slight improvement with a little bit more effort, we might get better. So, and now it's the point in time where truth is revealed, and you see, the blue line is now representing the market quotes and the red dots are the model prices. Um, in the upper subplot, it looks almost perfect, but therefore I've added like the lower subplot where we show the differences. The differences are not too huge. So here, for example, for a price level of 100, uh, I don't know what this is, 70 maybe, um, we have a price different in absolute terms of one euro. This is all in euro here. Um, the, um, the model does not yield biased values, right? So we have negative as well as positive deviations. But here, uh, at least in relative terms, for the smallest option price, we have the highest absolute deviation. So depending on the goal, depending on what you want to do, um, you might want to change from absolute deviations here to uh, relative errors but all this is again explained in uh, the class so this is about calibration where we make use of efficient markets but if you want to trade again then the tide turns the coin turns and we get here from four on into the pi algo world so still we are here in the computational finance world dx analytics this is again the world where we might benefit where we believe and where we trust in efficient markets. And you see, I'm as the major package, I'm importing DX, DX analytics. Here I'm modeling the risk factors, the constant short rate, a geometric brown emotion from, um, from uh, Black Scholes Merton, used since decades. I can visualize, um, select few of the simulated paths. Then maybe a second risk factor here um, with a different volatility, so higher volatility than the valuation model. You recall there was this, it's maybe now worth going back to this one, risk factor one, risk factor two. Now we come up with uh, the options themselves, right? 
So here a market environment for an American put option, present value, the delta, the gamma, Vega, all numerical values. These are all numerical estimators, uh, theta as well as rho. And we have here a second derivative based on a second risk factor. GBM2 is a European call option. Again, you see this behaves like flex codes, simply calling the methods delta, gamma, vega, theta, rho. They can also uh, be used a bunch of parameters. So risk factor one, two, European derivative and American derivative. Now, the next step here is to come up with an options portfolio. We model now certain yeah, quantity sets, I can say. First derivative position put, second derivative position call. And I now come up with, finally, that's the final step with the portfolio, including all risk factors, correlations, the positions, and the valuation environment. And this gives me, in the end, the derivatives portfolio. This might look like a little bit of overhead compared to, let's say, Flex Gold's Merton. That is overhead for Flex Gold's Merton. You can be more efficient with DX analytics, but DX analytics is not a replacement to any analytical formula of Flex Gold's Merton. It is a package that allows you to do stuff that closed form solutions and other numerical methods don't allow you to do. Now we get the values and the statistics. So what is happening now here, again, have a look here. We have risk factors, we have the, the uh, instruments, we have the positions, we have the portfolio. Now, when I initiate the valuation, it simulates the cash flows forward. And for the American uh, option, for example, it uh, comes up with the optimal exercise policy and risk neutral discounting backwards. All right now we have seen basically everything in action, although the relationship might not be fully clear. Uh, at this stage, at least. So we then have risk reports with regard to deltas. What are risk reports? They allow you to do what if analysis. Right here we have um, the delta. So this is the 100% um, initial price. Um, and here what happens to the portfolio value when there is a 10% drop? So from 100% uh, to 10%. Or what happens when the initial value increases by 10%? Right. So this is what we see here. We can also have a net view on that where we say 100%. This is the net net portfolio value. And when, for example, the initial value of the first risk factor decreases by 10%, we have a drop in portfolio value by 15%. So typical what if, if then analysis here. The same here with regard to the volatilities. Same idea, a little bit more granular now in 5% steps. So meaning five percentage points relative to the volatility. So this is not five points, 50 to 45. This is here 5% from 50%. So need to be careful in this regard. Still in the world of where we try to benefit from the efficient markets and where we translate our theory into uh, the application here with the package. Now we enter the world. Now we enter the world um, of um, the market prediction. Before we get into that, there's a question with regard to Bloomberg data. Uh, frankly and honestly, no. I don't have access to Bloomberg. I have discussed uh, with Bloomberg um, yeah, team members, uh, product managers, etc., uh, a couple of times. So it was even initiated by them, but they never came around the corner and said, well, we provide you with some teaching uh, tool there that we could use for the program. So they are as might be known in the market, they are not as open, for example, as Refinitiv. Refinitiv has like a pretty yeah, active, open developer community. They indeed have trial accounts and all of that. But I must say, confess, and even complain a little bit that Bloomberg never was willing nor open to uh, provide us with uh, kind of a teaching environment that we can use on an ongoing basis to uh, provide people like you who are now asking, uh, about the Bloomberg integration. I, I'm not happy about that, so I'm, I'm not contractually um, bound to Refinitiv in his contacts, but they, again, I tried, but they didn't want to uh, follow through in this regard. So now, in the algo trading world, we want to try to overcome 
uh, yeah. the curse of the efficient market because we want to beat the markets. We, if we would fully believe and trust in efficient markets, run the walks, etc., then we wouldn't even try to uh, trade in the markets, right? If you trade, you basically want to outsmart, uh, let's say, an ETF. Uh, that you can invest in at a very low cost and simply uh, hold it uh, for years on end, let's say for retirement. So uh, the game of algorithmic training is to try to outsmart the market, to beat the markets relative to a benchmark. And this is here now where I introduce AI and finance uh, based uh, yeah, market based market prediction based on financial features. So I work with uh, on the data set here. A static one, which is hosted on my uh, server, you see here 15,000 open, high, low, close elements with Rwanda, you get this data uh, for free. It's open um, once you have opened a test account. And I come up here more or less arbitrarily with a bunch of financial indicators like uh, high minus low, minus low, or volatility, V1, V2, simple moving average, one, two, momentum, one, two, and a couple of others, right? So this is what I um, what I do here. So to have some indicators, you, you could also add here to the mix, whatever comes to mind, like RSI, Bollinger Bands, um, you name, you name. This approach is uh, pretty agnostic in this regard. So we have the features, we have the data, we uh, split it here into 60% um, uh, for training and, and uh, validation accordingly, right? And uh, then have the rest of it as test data. We work with 10 lakhs, apply Gaussian normalization, and here you see that's like data pre-processing. You will see this over and over again. In a little bit more simple way, I've shown this in the context of the first notebook, working with lags. Here we deal with different features, plus lags, plus some of them that get, um, that get um, normalized and others not, but the approach is more or less the same. I do normalization and lagging, and I end up with a total of 210, 210 um, features in this context, right? So when I have a, a brief look, so I cannot really display it uh, all. You see here, they are like the triple dots. Uh, so this is now a data frame with 210 columns. So it doesn't even show them all, right? Therefore, it is commented out here in this context. So I now use the deep neural network from scikit-learn. So now we are really in the middle of AI. Um, deep neural network, two hidden layers, 156 uh, hidden units each. I do the fitting. You see on this level, this is all pretty, pretty uh, fast. And uh, I do the vectorized backtesting details uh, later. And what we see here is the blue line, which is the passive benchmark investment. And the green line, which is the strategy which outperforms over a period of time covered here, the passive benchmark investment significantly. If you would add leverage for the mix, let's say 10, we would end up maybe with some 50%. But, 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 and this is the biggest but you will hear today, um, this neglects transaction costs, uh, for example. So this is what we, what I would call, in particular in the context of AI and finance, a statistical inefficiency, but it might by no means be a economic inefficiency. So statistical inefficiency means that on a theoretical basis, on a numerical basis, I might be able to come up with such a strategy which outperforms the market considerably. But when I want to implement a trading strategy, in order to benefit from my statistical inefficiency, I might discover kind of easily and quickly that um, the transaction costs would eat up any benefit in this uh, context, right? So, but first things first, I need some statistical edge in order to gain an economic edge. That's the, the basic ruling here. So here we are in the game of trying to beat the market. If we want to implement a strategy to exploit inefficiencies that we might have discovered, I need a platform. So here I'm working with Wonder, with our package. So for example, the first four instruments. So when I get 
that one you see there are a bunch of instruments that i can trade so this differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction for example print crude oil is something we have a look at uh, also euro yes dollar and maybe some other indices so germany 30 which will be changed to germany 40 sometime soon and some other like spx 500 or nasdaq russell 2000 and a bunch of instruments some 124 Whatever this list is so usually i only show a couple of them so with regard to euro yes dollar here i'm retrieving historical data and this is again because there have been a couple of questions with regard to data retrieval and, and trial accounts when you have a demo a trial account with wonder you can get this historical data from wonder um, for free so there are no differences between the paper trading account and the real accounts you see here i'm retrieving data for last week, um, just one day, one minute bars, mid price. I get some 1,320 data points for the 8th of January, um, midnight until 10 p.m. here in this context. So I backtest here a momentum strategy based on Wanda data. Um, do a couple of uh, statistics here. So whether this holds true or not. So my hit ratio is not the best in the world. It's just 48%. Um, but let's have a look at it. So I have a slight outperformance. This was not the point here to come up with a fantastic results, um, but I just uh, adjusted it to the last available trading day um, so that we have most recent data and this simple strategy. Same holds true what I, what I said before. This might look nice, okay, whatever uh, you want to call it, but there are no transaction costs whatsoever involved in the analysis here therefore we need to be pretty pretty careful with our judgments but here you see visualized for the last 200 data points 200 minutes in this context how often the position changes from long to short so now placing trades is the point so let me open <clears throat> my on the web app i should be still locked in yeah here i am so it's now loading data from my account. So there is one open position. I wish I would have traded it with 10 times leverage. This trade alone would translate into plus 600%, but this is just a theoretical account here. But what I want to show you is that I can now create an order for Euro GBP. You see here the, um, the whole object that is uh, delivered back. So create order Euro GBP units 100. Let me check. And to see indeed Euro GBP 100. So this is now opened. Just by executing a single short line of Python code, I have opened a position here in this um, account. This, this is a paper trading account, right? So I could close it here manually, but this is not what you typically would do. Uh, you would rather go and say, well, um, here um, I have placed a, or opened a long position of 100 and then, for example, you close it directly. Uh, maybe you want to go short 100, but here I'm just closing the 100 by um, creating an order with minus 100 units. You see here that um, I get another object with all the details at what time, what the price was and uh, commission, p &L, and all that stuff there. Um, when I check back with my account, you see my position, my FX position. Um, FX position is uh, now gone. So just by executing it and there is activity and my, my most recent trade. So this is something I checked uh, earlier today, right? Um, and here you see um now my most uh, two most recent trades just like a minute or two ago executed and oh, uh, not only that i can check this back on the on the web application here um we, i also see the the last two trades just executed and the pnl uh, for closing it so i lost a little bit of money everything else would have been a surprise and when you think back of my pyramid, uh, I said, well, there comes the point <laughs> when you need to place orders, where you need to work with streaming data. And here you see a little example. Maybe I do some 17, for example. And uh, you can stream. Oh, Bitcoin has lost quite a bit during the day, some 3,000 roughly. And uh, you see BTC, US dollar. Um, I cannot trade with my own account BTC, but the streaming works. Um, I can also go with um, euro, US dollar, let's say, 
there we usually don't have that many ticks and up there yeah, currently it's pretty active also going fast it depends a bit on the time of the day and we see now streaming real-time data for euro yes dollar right so you can again stream we get the data we get this is bco now um, for all the instruments that i've shown before we can stream data we can combine this then with our logic for predicting and with placing orders I also have one more for Rwanda, but uh, for the sake of time, I'm skipping over that. Um, the final demo is about reinforcement learning. And again, just like a quick run through here is, you might recall it from the slide card poll. I said, this is a nice intro uh, environment. Uh, we talk in this context about the action space. Here I have only two actions. Then the observation space, that's kind of like the state of um, an environment here it is card position card velocity pole angle pole angular velocity then i need to take actions in order to step an environment forward so just that you have heard these um, expressions and notions and when i execute this code now it will um, visualize um, the environment and will open here this as well so in order to see this again let me maybe put the two of them together there so otherwise i cannot have them at the same time open in the back in the background you see here the um, can get rid of that i don't need this anymore so when i execute this you see both here in the jupiter lab as well as on the right hand side um, the visualization of the environment card pole is about balancing the pole on the card so by pushing it to the right and to the left that's the basic idea and the agent here should learn how to do this so going through the code here there's like a very basic introductory example with regard to one approach of solving this not really about reinforcement learning um, so once we have that and now we see it at the end here we can test the results so you see here 200 and 200 is a perfect score so here it's not the goal to balance the pole as long as possible so once i survive quote unquote um 200 steps of the environment then i'm considered to be a successful agent so of course i'm not doing it here with the joystick or with the keyboard the agent itself the software does it and now uh, once i have trained such an agent i have like a little bit more of an intelligent agent not just a random one as before um, you see how it balances the pole this runs pretty quickly here right um, so i can repeat this you see it reached 200 and uh, down there on the lower right you might see yeah yeah it balances it and once it reaches 200 this is now an agent which has mastered this little game so it doesn't fail anymore um not with regard to balancing the pole it always i'm not sure about always but it seems like uh it always uh for our trials here has reached so far the goal and i can repeat this a couple of times and i see it again was successful here. An agent is overall considered successful when over 100 consecutive games, the average score is 195 or above. All the details, more on this so fascinating field in uh, the program and the respective classes. You have, of course, access to these resources. I've shared already um, the link. So um, you can play around with it as of now. Or you simply say, well, lots of exciting stuff. I uh, keep that for later. It comes a little bit later because it requires a couple of other um, um, skills in this context. So let me uh, clear this up. So also this one here, I usually like to save my stuff without having that uh, code executed. This should also be cleared up and I'm finished with this little demo just to whet the appetite of what to expect and what to come in this context in particular with regard to trading here uh, we will need additional accounts but they are free and, and easy to set up so don't be afraid of that um, you will uh, be provided with the respective details
Quant platform, Python with Docker, efficient markets, model calibration, and DX analytics, where we make use of efficient markets, and then market prediction and wonder trading platform, reinforcement learning, where we try to overcome from an algo trader point of view the efficient market um, story in this context. There's also the link to the gist done there. So a study plan for the programs. There was a question how to best um, get started here. Um, I have shared this. This is something that is updated at least once per week, sometimes twice, some of the changes. And you see here, uh, you should read this uh, row by row. In the first three weeks, the two um, yeah, core programs are going hand in hand. You then see with finance with Python, obviously here, you then see the live sessions in red, typically I highlight them so that you don't miss the live sessions if you want to follow along. We have financial data science, tools and skills. And then what I mentioned before, we have AI and finance book on the Quant platform. So watch out for book. This is what is in any case recommended and optional. You also have AI and finance under a class which is simply called AI and Finance Traditional. You also have the other optional resources, so Python uh, with Excel can be started from the outset. You don't need that much Python at the beginning. Later on, we have OOP or some uh, reinforcement learning, what we discussed, starts also a little bit later. And so we go week by week, but in the beginning, Finance with Python, what you should focus on, data types, structures, and tools and skills, or what. And then, at least, you should also have a, a brief look at AI and finance. If you say, well, I start that part a little bit later, this is also not harmful. But for example, pre predicting market movements here, this relies then heavily on what is covered here in AI and finance. Yeah, that's the basic idea. And as we go, you will see this uh, red frame move down, down, down week by week. Uh, for the next week, I've already planned here sessions. Um, this might be a little bit in flux, so don't take this for granted. Uh, there might also sometimes be short notice uh, changes, but uh, these days when I'm not traveling that much, um, there are, is, is not that much of a risk <laughs> that I'm not there. But for example, just a personal story since yesterday until around noon today, we had uh, serious issues with our internet uh, service provider here. Um, so I was uh, not even sure whether we could do a proper session today, but I'm grateful that they managed to fix uh, the problem, with, which was not only related to our household here, to our building, so to say, but uh, to like our whole city. So I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, yeah, at first I didn't believe, but later on I was so happy that they resolved the issue just in time. So this is what I mean by maybe there is some short notice. Please uh, really keep up with the invites that I send and, and uh, also when there's some changes uh, as fast as I can, I will update here uh, the live session timings in this uh, context and yeah this is how we go uh, until we reach week 12 and from that on we will have to practice uh, and final project phase in this um, context there's a question with regard to optional so everything that is under this column here is meant to be optional right so um, here in AI and finance book, we have recordings, we have code, and we have reading assignments. So plus chapter one means chapter one of AI and finance. AI and finance one is the first video, the first session of AI and finance book class. So this is not just related to the video part. This is related indeed um, uh, here, the whole thing to the first module and the first chapter in this context. Yeah, review questions, exercise, and test projects. Starting with week uh, two, you will have uh, the opportunity to uh, work with exercise, to come up with your own solutions, and maybe later on to work uh, on with more involved test projects. And every three weeks, so after week three, six, nine, and 12, we provide also a set of review questions. This is more like for you to test yourself with regard to uh, the red line through the program, if you have like still the overview of all the topics. So here are the review questions for the, for the first uh, three weeks for the algorithmic training program. There's another set for the computational finance program. So Python in general, finance with Python, tools and skills, financial data science, AI and finance. So this is for you to test. This is not like that you should hand in something here. You should say, well, um, when I ask here, like one of my favorite topics, 
what do people understand under the technological singularity. So if you have read carefully through the resources in AI and finance, then this should be an easy uh, answer for you, easy question and easy answer for you um, to give in this context, right? So uh, that's the, the idea of the review questions. Then we have uh, yeah, simple to more involved, sometimes difficult um, um, exercises here, similar to what is covered in the materials themselves or in the book, in the text, in the code, and a few test projects, which might be a little bit beyond outside of what exactly is covered, right? Here, a little bit of a fun test project, and sometimes it might be a little bit more involved, working with a different data set or whatnot. So um, you should work on the exercise and then have a look at uh, the sample solutions. And we don't provide sample solutions for uh, everything, and that's for good reason. Right, so and there won't be. Don't ask me if there are no sample solution. Most probably there won't be any. So you need to get accustomed to the situation. Um, this will be the same for the final project, for the practice phase, and in real life, right? That there is no sample solution. And in general, so you can relax. There's also not one solution only, right? Uh, typically in programming in our field, there might be. 10 different approaches which are perfectly valid to solve a given problem. And if you get stuck uh, with whatever topic, issue, detail, you make use of the user form, right? So I've shown you already or walked you through uh, the basics of the user forum. You should read through it. You should um, digest what is there. You can also search for stuff. So I didn't show you the search function, but there is a search thing. So before you post maybe a question, maybe you search for related term or a central expression. Maybe something has been answered already or your exact same answer has been provided already. And uh, you should go through that. Again, email is not the right way uh, in the program to go through it. And this, there's a number of reasons because here uh, you give on the user forum the chance to our complete team to answer it. If you write me an email and I'm not available, let's say for 48 hours, then you sit there and you are a little bit surprised that you don't get feedback, right? And again, the team gets notified by email anyways for every single post and every single reply. Please, 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 please um, read through this post as carefully as required. So when you post something, do yourself and everybody else a favor and try to create a minimal, complete, and verifiable example. Use as little code as possible that still produces the problem. Provide all parts needed to reproduce the problem in the question itself. Test the code you're about to provide and make sure that it reproduces the problem. So. <laughs> Why am I emphasizing that that much? Because, um, again, you will be surprised, annoyed even, when you post something and I ask you several questions. Often I will even just post the link to um, the Stack Overflow page. Um, because there, there are a bunch of forum posts, and I know, I mean, if I do it myself, for example, I'm interacting with our team, and I say, well, man, I'm working on X, Y, that. Why doesn't it work? There is a big issue, help. And then they say, well, what are you working on? What is the context? What exactly did you do? Can you share the code? And therefore, I can completely relate to the situation because when you are stuck with a problem, you're already you know, getting nervous and, and uh, wanna, wanna quit or whatever, right? And then you, know, you hastily put together something in this context, but just think first and foremost, of the other side who receives your message, right? There's something, things like in the, in the one session of AI in finance, I use exactly the same code, but the results are different. Please help. I mean, everybody can say that basically there is no chance for me, for us to help in this context. Therefore, try to be as specific as possible. In, I was following along the video uh, of session number three in AI and Finance book. Uh, in the Jupyter Notebook that is shown there from line five on, there is the following code, and then you post the code. And then you try to keep it as small, as minimal as possible, as complete as necessary, and you check whether it is verifiable. And then I'm pretty sure we are quick and, and professional to help you with any issue that might arise in this context.
So last but not least, I said this is I, I, this is for me like a little bit of a of a tradition that I want to close with this part: importance of practice. And I have a couple of quotes from one of my favorite books about uh, expertise and about um, high performance. It's from Anders Ericsson and his co-author, Peak Secrets from the New Science of Expertise. And it's, on the one hand, it's like a message to you personally, um, also as a group, but it's also a little bit of a, how should I say, a softener and it helps us to relax in terms of like getting not to the point where we want to quit too early and where we like getting desperate because we might not at the first try understand everything that is covered or everything that is required, right? So uh, let's get started here. When you look at how people are trained in the professional and business worlds, you find the tendency to focus on knowledge at the expense of skills. So uh, to put it in my words, it's not enough uh, to master the program and to just read the books. So when People reach out and say, well, you're publishing all these books. Why do you share all this? Uh, you make your program obsolete. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Just by reading books, it's like, this is like saying I have uh, here, now let me turn around. I don't know how many math books and, and AI books and et cetera, finance books I have on my sh shelf here behind me, right? This is like saying I, I have five books available. So now I'm, I don't know, master of science in mathematics, I'm a master of science in uh, deep learning. Uh, you need the skills, you need the experience. And this is what our program is about. You need to build, you should build, and you're supposed to build skills, not accumulate knowledge. Therefore, here the next quote, I believe the best approach will be to develop skills-based training programs. Um, ours is not 100%, so we still build the theoretical foundation to some extent and some yeah, practical notions, of course, are shared. Um, but we want to yeah, follow the third quote here, training should focus on doing rather than on knowing. You should rather skip, let's say, the one or the other chapter of a book, but watch the videos, follow along the live sessions, go through the codes, and do the exercises. So rather skip the reading than the practical parts of the program. That's the message. And here as well, so no matter which area you study, music, dance, sports, competitive games, or anything else with objective measures of performance, you find that the top performers have the top performance have devoted a tremendous amount of time to developing their ability. So there is no master that falls from the skies, as we say here in Germany, right? Um, and if it's music, dance, boards, competitive games, or anything else, and then anything else you can now put in here, financial engineering, algo trading, Python programming, uh, a general technological skills, software engineering, et cetera. So does anything else is everything that we're going to cover here, right? Um, there is no top performer where, which you see at the conference, these days probably digitally, um, yeah, who has done this for four weeks and now, performs during a keynote, a live coding session. This takes time. So, and this is like, I think comforting that if you get started on your journey, simply honor the fact that it will take time, right? Don't get desperate uh, or lose interest, right? You need to keep up. So like Woody Allen said, uh, showing up is 80% of success, right? So show up, do your stuff. Uh, repeat, 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 do, 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 instead of like just think um, and, and read, 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 right? So I think this is quite comforting for, for all of us. And last but not least here from one of our, you see here, February 2018, and I still leave it here. I have a couple of other quotes that I could put in here, uh, but this was like after uh, building the program over years already and trying to add more and more skills to the mix where we thought, well, this might help people. This this might be missing still. And uh, this is uh, like the piece which hopefully makes it a little bit rounder and better for people to understand. Um, therefore, I keep still this quote uh, from Elvis, uh, February 2018, where I said, I liked watching your videos, but it's much more interesting and educational to actually build something on my own. And this is how we change the program to empower people to do it on your own, right? You can watch 20 lectures on YouTube about um, the current unified theory in physics, like uh, string theory or whatnot. If you don't sit down and study for your own, 
pen and paper. Same holds true for mathematics and so many other things. Or think in terms of playing the piano. You can watch playing Lang Lang all day, but this probably won't make you a master. You can watch Magnus Carlsson playing chess uh, like a god uh, on earth. Uh, this helps to a little extent, but it won't make you a grandmaster, even after 10 years of pulling along Magnus Carlsson. We, you need to get to the point where you say, well, fantastic, I did it on my own. I built the car on my own. Right, I didn't go there and rented the car and brought it back. They later I can build it on my own. Um, yeah, this brings me to the end. Maybe this uh, final question that I can answer in this context. Um, all the live sessions are still available. So, for example, we have the mentoring session in the last cohort. We will have our own mentoring sessions, uh, but they are still available and you have access to all the resources that I promised you. So, um, I change sometimes a little bit the numbers. Uh, I'm not a, the biggest believer in like saying, uh, well, we have 300 hours of recorded instruction instead of 200. So, we rather try to improve the 200 that we offer. Uh, by default, but there are still uh, many, many more resources that you have access to in this context. It's a good question. And having said that, uh, with my yeah, with my plenary about uh, the importance of practice, I uh, now send you into the program into the first week. Uh, wish you all the best. Wish you uh, wish you a great, great start. Uh, first and foremost, happy Python coding. This is our credo. Um, and successful algo trading in the end, as well as a, a fantastic financial engineering time. Um, I hope you will be or are as excited as I am. And I see you uh, for sure in the next sessions. There are many, many more to come. If you have questions, reach out via the user forum. All the best. See you in one of the next sessions. Take care. Bye-bye.